we don't know who built these monuments. We don't know when they were built, we don't know why they were built, and in most cases, we have absolutely no idea how they were built. Historians and archaeologists present us with a kind of sanitized view of the past. We're presented with a picture of the past as though everything's sewn up and sorted out and everybody knows exactly what's happened. But if you go into this in depth, as I have done, what you find is that these historical opinions are pure speculation. All that we know about the people who built these monuments is what we can deduce from the monuments themselves. And if we look at these monuments with open minds and open eyes, we find something very interesting. Firstly, that the level of technology involved in creating them was high, the lifting and maneuvering of these huge blocks of stone. And secondly, that they incorporated fantastically accurate astronomical alignments, which could only have been the result of a very accurate observational science. So this is what the monuments tell us. They tell us that the people who built them were serious and intelligent people with a scientific outlook on life. And that's the testimony of the monuments. And no matter what the historians or the archaeologists say, the monuments continue to tell us that story. There has been much speculation concerning the secret significance of numbers. Though many interesting discoveries have been made, it may be safely said that with the death of Pythagoras, the great key to this science was lost. For nearly 2,500 years, philosophers of all nations have attempted to unravel the Pythagorean skein, but apparently none have been successful. Notwithstanding attempts made to obliterate all records of the teachings of Pythagoras, Fragments have survived, which give clues to some of the simpler parts of his philosophy. The major secrets were never committed to writing, but were communicated orally to a few chosen disciples. These apparently dared not divulge their secrets to the profane, the result being that when death sealed their lips, the arcana died with them. The study of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy was considered essential to a rational understanding of God, man, or nature, and no one could accompany Pythagoras as a disciple who was not thoroughly familiar with these sciences. The God of Pythagoras was the monad, or the one that is everything. He described God as the supreme mind distributed throughout all parts of the universe, the cause of all things, the intelligence of all things, the power within all things. He further declared the motion of God to be circular, the body of God to be composed of the substance of light, and the nature of God to be composed of the substance of truth. Pythagoras taught that both man and the universe were made in the image of God, that both being made in the same image, the understanding of one predicated the knowledge of the other. He further taught that there was a constant interplay between the grand universe and man. Pythagoras believed that all the sidereal bodies were alive, and that the forms of the planets and stars were merely bodies encasing souls, minds, and spirits, in the same manner that the visible human form is but the encasing vehicle for the invisible spiritual organism, which is, in reality, the conscious individual. Pythagoras regarded the planets as magnificent deities, worthy of the adoration and respect of man. All these deities, however, he considered subservient to the one first cause within whom they all existed temporarily, as mortality exists in the midst of immortality.
Arithmetic is to be learned the first of the mathematical sciences, because it has the relation of a principal and mother to all the rest. For it is prior to all of them, not only because the fabricator of the universe employed this as the first paradigm of his distributed intellection, but also constituted all things according to number. But the priority of arithmetic is also evinced by this. Whenever that which is prior by nature is subverted, that which is posterior is at the same time subverted. But when that which is posterior perishes, that which is prior suffers no essential mutation of its former condition. Thus, if you take away animal, the nature of man is immediately destroyed. But by taking away man, animal will not perish. When you speak of man, you will at the same time introduce animal, for man is an animal. But if you speak of animal, you will not at the same time introduce the species of man, for animal is not the same as man. The same thing is seen to take place in geometry and arithmetic. For if you take away numbers, whence will the triangle or cube or whatever else is the subject of geometry subsist, all which are denominative of numbers? But if you take away the triangle or the cube, then the whole of geometry is subverted. Three and four, and the appellations of other numbers will not perish. Again, when we speak of any geometrical figure, it is at the same time connected with some numerical appellation, but when we speak of numbers, we do not at the same time introduce geometrical figures. This is why when studying the quadrivium, which is comprised of four subjects, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, arithmetic must come first. It is essentially the monad of Pythagoras, to which everything must proceed. Nothing can exist or be understood without the nature of numbers.